Welcome to the Still Life Podcast, a series of 21 topics, with each episode exploring the practical nature of the spiritual experience. With time-tested insights from psychotherapy, evolutionary biology, and meditation, from ex-animator and stillness coach, Jim. Because I view Jim George as a trainer for the soul. There's no better animation artist, drawer than Jim. He is a friend, he is a mentor, incredible advisor. There's no one who's more important to me in my life. The most interesting, most intelligent person I've ever met. He truly is somebody who wants nothing from you and everything for you. My name is Henry, and I'm a former client of Jim's, and the work we've done together over the past eight years has changed my life. We're now on a mission to share these insights with you and to draw some pretty interesting conclusions on how to live a still life. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Still Life podcast. My name is Henry. I'm your co-host, and today's episode is episode four of 21 in our mini-series. We will be talking about breaking habits. Now, this is something that personally I spent a lot of time playing around with and really using stillness to help to recognize the mechanism of a habit and then to change it, to really orient my behavior towards my ideal self. Now, this has all come with a lot of help from Jim especially, and so I thought it a good topic to dig into. He starts off by defining what a habit really is, and then the mechanism of a habit and how to understand that within yourself. And then we get into some more uh, therapeutic territory again, I apologize, where I start bringing up some of my less glamorous habits in this instance, drinking alcohol in excess, and Jim really helps to peel apart what's driving that habit and then how to adjust it in the future. As always, I hope that you get as much utility out of this as I did, but I can't really make up your mind, so I'll let you do that. Anyway, sit back and enjoy. Well, we've got a big topic today. Uh Uh-oh. And one that I think (laughs) stillness can be really instrumental in helping, and that is breaking habits. Ooh. Wow. Yeah. 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 Ooh. Yikes. So, (laughs) just to get us kicked off. You do know how to pick them. Well, it's it's really easy because I just think to myself, how has stillness helped me, Mm. and uh, how do I want stillness to help me in the future? Yeah. And a lot of that comes from I I become more empowered within myself when I understand myself better, Mm -hmm. and when it comes to habits, it's like that's something that I really want to turn the spotlights of stillness onto Mm -hmm. so that I can understand them more and then do something about them. And so that's why I sort of, it's really easy to pick these because it's like, okay, where do I need help? Okay, bad habits, how do I break them? (laughs) Sure, sure. sure. So to kick off, um, what are habits and why do we have them, Jim? Wow. Wow. So again, remember, this is just my take on stuff. If it's helpful, great. If not, it's a big big dumpster out and back, we can toss it. <laughs> but I like to think of habits as patterns of behavior that no longer require our conscious attention. They no longer require our deliberation at a conscious level. They've achieved what neuroscientists refer to as automaticity. They're automatic. And these habits are formed as we pursue goals by repeating given behaviors over and over and over again in a certain context, a specific context. And neurologically, these behavior patterns, as they say, that we continue to allow to fire together, then begin to wire together. They become myelinated. (laughs) Um, And they then run themselves as long as they have a kind of trigger, what they call a behavior or a habit cue. So why do we have them? 
in a word efficiency. Hmm. From an evolutionary standpoint, we biological creatures need energy in order to function and even survive. So that means that every one of us biological creatures in nature are on what we'll call an energy budget. And it's a serious budget. It's not one of these things where if I run over, I just put it on my card. This is a budget of life and death. If we use more energy than we have taken in, we die. So let's go back to the drawing board, see if we can get a clearer picture of this energy budget and how habits can serve energy and are more efficient. So our early ancestors developed quite a few complex behaviors and behavior patterns, some of which were very useful, <laughs> like making fire, for instance. But these patterns, when done in a purely conscious level, required a lot of energy, a lot of brain power. And remember, the brain uses more energy, more glucose, than any of the other organs in the body. And don't forget, everything in nature is on an energy budget. <laughs> and Mother Nature doesn't mess around. You use more energy than you take in, and you're going to die. Now, that meant that if our ancestors could do this process, whatever it was, again and again and again and again, they could make it a habit. That is, this thing achieved automaticity. Well, then this pattern took a whole lot less brain power because all of that conscious thought is on automatic pilot now. All it required is what's called a habit cue. A habit cue. In this case, just being cold enough <laughs> or hungry enough to trigger the habit. And how this guy wound up in Antarctica, I don't know, but you get the idea. So that meant that our ancestors were able to survive, to thrive long enough to pass their genes and some of those behavioral patterns and habits, pass those on to future generations. <laughs> Does that make sense? So those are the stakes on this energy budget. Well, we human beings, we homo sapiens, have evolved a kind of evolutionary gamble which is these huge brains of ours. These huge brains, incredibly complex. And these brains use a lot of energy in the form of glucose, the primary sort of energy molecule the body breaks down. The human brain uses more glucose than any other organ in the body. And I'd like to suggest that when the higher regions of the brain, the neocortex, specifically that prefrontal cortex and these executive functions that happen that require conscious deliberation, when those things are cooking, that human brain can use more glucose than all the other organs combined. So that's a very taxing 
investment of energy and time. Because those higher cortical regions require more time, they're slower because they have to do more, neurologically speaking. So <clears throat> if you just imagine having to consciously perceive and then deliberate on every single thing you do during the day, each and every time you do it. It's almost inconceivable, but try. We wouldn't be able to function at all. We'd be overwhelmed and most likely wind up dying. <laughs> so far out of our energy budget we'd be. So what habits offer us is a kind of default response that will occur automatically unless we have the motivation and the ability to tailor our behavior to current circumstances consciously. So for you to get a better idea of what I'm talking about here, imagine how many habits you engage at a completely unconscious level from the time you get up in the morning till the time you go to work, whatever going to work means. Think about making coffee or tea. Think about how many choices. Can you imagine having to determine where is the coffee stored? Do I even want coffee? Do I want tea? Do I da 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 da? da? How do I make this thing? I, it, it uses water. Where is the water? Oh, that's right. The water is located in the... Imagine something as simple as brushing your teeth. It's completely automated behavior that you can do while you're on the phone. You can do it while you're thinking completely other thoughts, but you want to try an interesting experiment with how valuable habits are just switch hands when you go to brush your teeth. That's all. Everything you do with your left hand, do with your right hand, and watch what happens. All of a sudden, it's like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. And your mind has to consciously do much of what's automated in the form of a habit. you will wind up getting toothpaste in your eye if you're not careful. <laughs> so what I'm saying is, in the same way that good programming takes an entire piece, let's call it an action or a behavior, and makes it one bit of information, X equals this piece of code. So every time X now appears, it means that piece of code. We never have to write that piece of code again. X is all we need to write. So this piece of behavior has now been encoded, and all it requires is a trigger, a habit cue. That is, something occurs that triggers it, and then something happens that says, okay, this patterned behavior has finished, it served its purpose, now we can exit that program. The efficiency that that offers us, both in energy and in speed, is literally life-saving. Without these habits, I'd like to suggest you could not only not get in your car, you, you try to drive it, you couldn't even find the keys or the fob to even get there. There are so many. As much as 70% of what we do 
is habit. Unconscious habit. It's the difference between staying alive and not. That's how important they are, but that's why we have them. Efficiency, time efficiency, and energy efficiency. That makes sense? It couldn't make more sense. That okay. Was a, that was a brilliant answer. Okay. So if we're just talking about the energetic budget that we have, what yeah. I got from this is that it's far easier to conserve energy than to find energy, at least it was for yes. our ancestry. Still is, by and, the way. And so yeah. if, if we're conserving energy uh, really at every avenue possible <laughs> when looking at basically where energy is being allocated within our body, yes. the mind is taking a lot of that. And so if we're just parsimonious, if we're basically trying to reduce the amount of the neocortex that's being utilized, mm -hmm. what we can do is create the X equals piece of code. The neocortex is pulling that piece of code together. Yes. The, the subconscious mind can then abbreviate that to X. Yes. Create an action pattern around it. Yes. So next time that we go to ride a bike or brush our teeth, we can just press X and all of a sudden yes. that repeated pattern yes. will just play itself out. Yes. And what we have there is a habit. Yes. An automated sort of sequence of actions towards a intended outcome that yes. has been practiced over time. That has been vetted and mm -hmm. practiced and serves some purpose. And so it becomes automatic. Yeah. yeah. So when thinking about breaking habits, mm -hmm. if we just sort of look under the hood there, there's an implication that we want to adjust these habits to make them more uh, ideal for an intended outcome per se. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for connection. And within that piece of code, it's like you go to the bar with a group of friends and you drink a bunch of beer and you get what you're looking for, which is connection. And because there are a couple of, well, there's a substance in there that releases dopamine that could in itself be addictive, mm -hmm. it's sort of lumped and bundled with that. And finding something that is a basic human need, which is connection, is now uh, sort of tethered to an activity that might not necessarily be helpful or healthy for what I want to become in the future. Right. So when it comes to actually breaking habits, it's it's more so let's be really specific with what the action pattern is that we want to break in terms of what maybe it's the associative clump of activities together. Mm -hmm. So firstly, what is a bad habit? Why mm -hmm. would we consider something bad? Why would we label it bad? And then secondly, when thinking about habits that we might want to break, using the example of trying to gain connection through drinking with friends, how could mm -hmm. we pull the different components apart to then say, actually, I think that I want to reduce the amount of alcohol that I intake. How, how would you recommend somebody to go about breaking that aspect of a habit that had been Sure. Made? Let's start with what, why do we label something a bad habit? I'd like to suggest that we label something a bad habit the minute we realize that it's become what I'll call pathological. Mm. That is, it's no longer serving our well-being. Very frequently what happens is people then say, this is just a bad habit. It doesn't serve me. It never has. I don't know how it happened. But I, well, based on what we've already said, yeah, we do know why it happened because it did serve at some point or you wouldn't have practiced that behavior enough to make it a habit. So we can think of a bad habit as a habit that no longer serves our well-being. But at one point it did. So we want to we want to keep that piece mm -hmm. because we're going to come back to it. Then when we talk about how do we break it, or at least break part of a habit, 
This is where, and not to be self-serving, but in stillness, and you and I can do this right now, in stillness, we go back and we say, let's take a look at the path that we believe we took to make that into a habit. I'm going to paraphrase, but I, Henry, value connection. So I go to the bar, I drink with my friends, and I get connection. Okay, I'm paraphrasing. Now you're saying that the consumption of alcohol is a bad habit. My question is, why alcohol in the first place? You say you want connection, but why alcohol? I think that it helps to uh, remove some anxieties. Stop right there. You hit it. So your goal, okay, isn't really connection, it's to remove anxiety. Now, we can, we can abstract that. I'm removing anxiety, so it will be easier for me to make connection. But the real thing you're, you're trying to accomplish here is I'm trying to remove anxiety. So in stillness, anxiety removal doesn't equal too much alcohol. It just so happens that the perception as you're past your first shot and the dopamine's no longer doing what it does, so trying to get more and more relaxed, you're just making yourself more and more stupid because it's not having that effect of reducing any more anxiety. Now you're actually in a counterproductive piece. But that very first piece, yeah, it reduced my anxiety. Sure, there are all kinds of things that will reduce your anxiety. Going into a coma <laughs> will reduce your anxiety. But it's going to interfere with connection which you said was your primary goal. I'm going to make a, an outlandish suggestion to you, and that is that consuming too much alcohol interferes with your connection. And let me, let me just suggest that as long as everybody is getting progressively stupid, the illusion is we're connecting more. But the reality is we're forgetting more and more of what we're even doing. I'm suggesting that if you go to the root cause of the alcohol, anxiety, are there, are there more beneficial ways of dealing with anxiety? Let me ask you a question. As you take a slow, deep, belly first breath right now, hold it. And as you have so beautifully learned to do, let that breath just trickle out of your mouth now. Slow, slow. There you go. Like a feather. Okay? Let me ask you a question. Do you want a drink? No. Why? Don't have any anxiety to relieve. True. Why does anyone do anything from our values workshop? Why does anyone do anything? The deepest, most fundamental level. To feel better than they do right now. Okay, and the operative word is try. To try to feel better than they do right now. Would alcohol help you feel better Right now. No. It actually wouldn't. The habit, 
might make you drink before you ever went through this process. But if instead, every time you walked into a bar, you did this, even two or three times, and you had anchored this to a series of stillness techniques so that one breath could drop you to the same absence of anxiety that two or three shots would have given you, but you're actually more present for the connection, which would you choose to do? Not, oh my God, I'm fighting this thing that I really want to do. Which would you choose to do? Well, I think that's easy to make the choice in this setting, but I've dealt with this a lot for the last five years in terms of shaking that bad habits of yes. alcoholism in, in particular. Yes. And I wish it were as easy as getting into the bar and taking the deep breaths because I used to do that. I would go to the bathroom and I'd look at myself in the mirror, take a couple of deep breaths and like, sure. be like, great, I want to, I don't want to take this to, <laughs> we just talked about moderation not so long sure. ago, you know, sure. I don't want to take this to an excessive point. Yeah. And what I found was that like I could get into that state of stillness well while in while in the bathroom and then going out into I would forget it so quickly. Yes. And the 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 strength of the habit would take over yes. in absolutely no time. Because it is a default response unless you have the motivation and the ability to tailor your behavior to current circumstances, and that takes more effort, mm. takes more energy, and it may even take a little more time because it's a cognitive process, and most people don't want to invest the time or the energy. Breaking a habit is creating a new habit. That takes energy, takes time, it takes will, it takes conscious awareness. It is much less efficient, though much more beneficial, than letting your default habit run and, oh, the hell with it, I'm just going to go get plastered yet again. Because you're practicing the habit. You're, you're embedding that habit even more deeply in your neurology. You see, that's the challenge. You didn't hear me say it's easy. You will hear me say it's simple. Hmm. And the question is, what are your goals? Do you want to be free of alcohol? Or it's up to you. That's why I'm reticent to call anything a good or a bad habit. I don't know what your life is. I only know what my life is. And I'm, I mean that. There are people that, that I would not, there are clients that I have literally said, now, now's probably not the time to try to quit drinking. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. Because they've got bigger fish to fry right now. So I don't, I don't know if I've thrown too many loose ends at you, but that's, that's the, the fundamentals of what you're asking. Yeah, and I think that what's really helped me in breaking that habit, because it's, it's been a few years, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm proud to say that like, I'm, I'm not bound by alcohol as I Good for you. was in the past. Good for you. And I think what was very helpful for me, and this really tethers into prior conversations as well, is firstly having meaning, Knowing what I, knowing that I wanted to be or felt a part of something larger and not wanting to jeopardize that. Yeah. But also identifying with other aspects. For example, identifying with this company still life. Yeah. You know, wanting to resemble it, be the same as it, be yes. identical to it. You yes. Know? There was a fundamental hypocrisy that's like, oh yeah, let me tell you about still life. Uh, two Jager bombs, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, that yeah. really didn't go down so well. Sure. And building trust and rapport with people so that they could have an opportunity to play with this tool within themselves was very important to me. Yeah. 
And being able to do that, using those two aspects in conjunction were really helpful. But to start with, I, I had to sort of, you said that there's this aspect of willpower. Mm-hmm. And I'm not very good with willpower. Because if I, it feels like there's two voices within me. You know, if I go to the supermarket and I buy a bunch of beef jerky and I put all the beef jerky in my cupboard, right? If I walk by it and I don't have it, I'll be like, great, you did well. And if I walk by it a couple of more times and I don't have it, I'm like, wow, you're doing so well. You deserve some of that beef jerky. Mm -hmm. And I collapse. Mm -hmm. And so what's been really helpful is to make a few decisions that then have a domino effect and make decisions for me in the future Mm -hmm. where it's like maybe I just don't buy the beef jerky in the first place. (laughs) Right. Because I'm not going to leave the apartment to go get some more. Right. And so I I say all of this because there was a a period when trying to break the habit of drinking where it's like they say in Alcoholics Anonymous, if you don't want to slip, don't go where it's slippery. Mm -hmm. I just didn't go where it was slippery for a while. Right. And I think that that was really helpful to extinguish the, the... or get closer to extinguishing the pattern, the neurological sequence of events. You eliminated the habit cue. There we go. If there's no on-off switch, the habit doesn't get turned on. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that to the point of relieving anxiety, I say that I wanted connection, but I think a lot of... A connection is such a loose term. It is. If if I really zoomed in to what it was, it was uh, public recognition, and brilliant. And that that comes to it, again was impinged upon what other people think of me. Right. And a lot of the connection was yes, I would forget the evening. But the next morning, when speaking to other people about how stupid all of the group activities, in particular my involvement with those group activities sure. were, sure. there was a, a gain of status, yes. you know, a gain of, of um, appreciation or of humor to a degree where it's like, oh, how funny is that, that you did all yeah. of that stuff. Yeah. And that's what I was hooked on. And as well as, you know, the booze itself. Because Can that I is ask you a question substance. about that? Please. Because I, I don't want to make too fine a point of this, but I went to college in a particular university that was known for its social life. And I went to a lot of parties. And the irony is, I've only been drunk once in my life, and that was to test it, to literally experience it under controlled circumstances so I could even know what it was. Otherwise, I can't talk about it. The entire time I was going to these parties, these people thought I was shit-faced, I'm assuming this isn't going on the Disney Channel, so I'm going to be (laughs) careful here. What I'm suggesting is I was never drinking. They thought I was crazier, more loopy than anyone else. It had nothing to do with alcohol. It had to do with my state. And even back in the college days, I knew enough about state to know all you have to do is you change your state, you change your world. And the the freedom to actually be a complete lunatic, a fearless lunatic in terms of humor, that's just a state change. I'm suggesting that it's even more beneficial to be able to stop that if the place catches fire instead of laying around in your own urine laughing and burning alive. So all I'm saying is that at some point, if we get quiet enough, you really get to decide, not by default, but decide what do I want and why? Then chase it. 
you and I have talked about this. If you get perfectly still, perfectly still, and decide what I want is to go on a bender, I'll steer you to the, the best deal on booze if it's what you truly want. But if it's not what you want, if going on a bender is going to get you away from the tension and the stress that's making you fit, well, then we're going to do some work first. So there's, I'm not saying there's intrinsic right or wrong or good or bad about any of this. I, I don't think there is. But relative to you, you finally decide, wow, it's the drinking part. The drinking isn't really allowing me to be funny. You're hilarious. In fact, I would suggest that without the deleterious effects on your prefrontal cortex, that you would be much funnier sober. But by sober, I don't mean dull. I don't mean flat and boring. I just don't mean so intoxicated, and don't forget where we get that word. Hmm. The toxic part is the key. You've got actually more of what it is that you want, more ability to connect, more ability to be hilariously funny, to even appreciate what humor is. Well, I just had two light bulbs go ting ting oh, good. in my head. Good. Uh, the first being, I really struggled when I would go to these slippery places and not yeah. drink. Yeah. And you just really helped to illuminate that it wasn't the not drinking that was what was making me struggle. Nice. It was the state of mind that I was bringing to it. Yes. Because people can pick up on that whether they consciously know it or not. Yeah. And I remember way back in the day when I was studying for my MCAT. I decided I don't want to drink and it was really easy because I had this excuse and it was a really good one that people could connect with right away. Sure. There was no insecurity and people were like, good for you and you're still at the party, that's awesome. Right. right? Um, when I was going into these sort of environments with more of an insecurity where it's like, I'm actually trying to stop doing this. Yes. Uh, they could pick up on that state of mind. They could Are pick you up- going to think less of me for not joining in the group? Exactly, exactly. Sure. And people could pick up on that and feed mm-hmm. off of it. And it wasn't necessarily, that was making it harder to break the habit. Yes. Instead of if I had invented an excuse, where it was like, oh, you know, I'm I'm pregnant. You know, <laughs> people right. aren't going to give me a hard time about right. it, are they? Well, they might. Well, yeah, they, they, that Consider- might actually provoke some other questions. Yeah. 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 <laughs> anyway. Anyway, there was another point where um, I was just re-watching and uh, going through the identity thing that we filmed. And there was a a point that you mentioned where when somebody is taking more time to really get whatever it is that they're saying out, I don't want to use myself in this example because I'm actually trying to think about things, Um, but I do take a long time to think about things and get it out, so I apologize. Uh, But you mentioned that it might be the case that they're trying to be somebody that they're not and that they're a step away and they're activating this prefrontal cortex because the... The analogy that you used is the the in the attic watching the party. Yes. Instead of actually being there. Yes. And I think for me, a lot of the the reasons that well, one of the reasons that I was so attracted to alcohol in the first place is because of this dulling of the prefrontal cortex, I could kind of switch off that mechanism that was trying to be somebody that I wasn't. Why? Uh, because what? Well, why was I able to do that? What's wrong with who you are? Well, there's, there's nothing wrong with who I am, but I had been rewarded in the past for being a caricature of myself. And that was something that I constantly wanted to inflate because people liked that. And, and that was something that was, it was really important to me, and it still is, to have this, this feeling that other people like and appreciate me. More important than respect you? At that point, yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. If you had said no, well, we'd have to investigate that because your behavior says 
No, who cares about the respect? I want people to like me, to appreciate me. And these are all values, driving behavior. But understand that having goals drives action by clearly defining an end state. There's a marvelous team, Wendy Wood. I can't re- uh God, I can't remember the other name. Bruce, somebody, who, who did enormous work. We'll, we'll have to add this, make an addendum. I'll, I'll come up with it later, I know. Yeah. Um, did tremendous clinical work with habits. And... Their, their finding was how important goals are because these goals literally energize and drive action by clearly defining an end state. So you will repeat that action again and again in an attempt to get this end state. The end state in your case is people like and appreciate me. And I feel what when they give me signals that they like and appreciate me? What do I feel? Accepted. Good. And when I feel accepted, what does that give me? A sense of calm. Calm. Well, it's not really calm. I feel accepted and that, that gives me a sense of like, it's, it's kind of security. I think this all loops back to yes. status to a degree. Yes. Where it's like, this group likes me. Yes. And so uh, they'll, they'll keep me close if things get tough. And uh, there's just this very primordial uh, correlation there where it's like, and that's increasing my likelihood to survive, I guess, maybe. Well, let's get to I feel security. Mm-hmm. Okay. The fun part about working with values through stillness, just working abstractly with values, you're, you're just going to lie to yourself. But you have this ability to get still and work with your values. And so now all we have to do is use what you've said. There's just wisdom. Your, your true inner self is begging for these questions, okay? What are you insecure about? Why do you need security? And we're talking back when you were drinking. Why? Uh, It gave me a, a higher sort of chance to cooperate with people. What are you insecure about? You're looking for security, I don't have security. What are you insecure about? Oh, my personality. Good. Why? There's a, an obvious answer that I'm a paranoid homo sapien, so that could be, that could be one piece to it, but why am I insecure about my personality? Um, at that stage in my life, I was young, yeah. And still, I'm still fairly relatively young, but sure. like trying to find my feet. And so uh, I guess there was, there was a lot up in the air and trying to understand who I could become and trying on different, different sort of costumes as such. Um, I don't know if I'm, I'm getting to, if you're leading me to. I'm not leading you anywhere. I know I'm you're just not. asking a question. And, and this, is, this is the whole thing that I love about sort of this inquiry because as soon as we get to new terrain, the, there isn't an answer that comes too quickly. And so I just keep talking and hope that the answer comes as I talk. So again, if any of this gets too personal, you stop. Not at all, Emma. What is standing between you and the direct answer that is trying, believe me, trying to come right up? What's standing between you and that answer right now? I think my ego trying to protect me. Yes. From what? Uh, something that could be harmful. To? Uh, my ego. Yeah. The story, right? Because who you really are 
makes that ego look like an idiot. I will tell you that from firsthand experience. Who you really are makes that narrative look like a cheap comic book. And every day, more of who you really are comes through. And that cheap 2D comic book starts taking on 3, 4, 5, 11D reality. And it's a beautiful process. So, Jim, I want to consciously work on my values. And one of those values that I want to be within my top three in my hierarchy is growth. Good. And so in order to do that, Could you please help me with changing the question to hopefully be able to move around this big block that is my ego Mm -hmm. and help me to understand or at least to get to the next step in understanding what it is that I was afraid of in the first place? Good. What's missing in you that, or what's present in you that these people that you're trying to impress are not going to like. I just got still and I could feel all of these different parts of myself that had, uh, that had built up to me. Yes. And the, the parts that I just don't show or I don't, I don't advertise. Why? Why? they might not feel contextually appropriate or they might not, like they're sort of a childish, a lot of them. Have you ever wondered why the behaviors at especially very young parties are always the same? I had an amazing experience one time when I was in the film business. I was invited to one of these Hollywoody things with big wigs and whatever. And my wife and I were walking around feeling about as out of place as we could possibly be. Being nice, doing what people do, trying not to backbite. That was the one thing we were trying to avoid. (laughs) But the interesting thing, by the end of the evening, all of these people in the context of the party wound up gathering around where I was just sitting there with this big wig producer and his kid doing what you and I are doing. And it was the, it was the place to be. Nobody was drinking. Nobody was acting stupid. They were acting real, but no one had ever broken that contextual, this is what you do when you're at a party. First, this is how you stand. And every once in a while you do this and everyone just talks about their stories and blah, blah, blah. And the only time it gets real is when you're in the car on the way back saying, oh, geez, those Philbies, they drive me nuts. (laughs) This was a magic moment, though, because we broke that context. And I'm saying I didn't do something intentional. I was just being who I am. And I'm sure there were people who were still out, you know, trying to find the, the bar at this point, who, who just thought that was idiotic. That's not what you do at a party. But it was a memorable party because of the magic, not because I was trying to get attention. I was pretty much listening <laughs> by the time this thing took off. People are starving for authenticity. They're just afraid to be authentic. Maybe maybe it's not so much a fear thing. Maybe it's they don't necessarily have the tools to, to be authentic in the first place. Because I not know yet. That, yeah. Not yet. Yeah. Because I know that uh, stillness has been incredibly beneficial for that. And again, stillness is a, it's a bloody word. It is. What I mean by that is a state of being without the, the narrative, without mm-hmm. the natter. Mm-hmm. And you can train your mind to get there whenever you need. And exactly as you were just mentioning that, I think to myself that I could have been far more elegant going into these bars when I wasn't necessarily all that conscious of my state of mind mm-hmm. and was sort of this 
frail and uncomfortable version of myself that was desperately grasping for approval and mm-hmm. saying, oh no, you know, I'm not drinking and not necessarily getting that approval whatsoever. Instead, yeah. making people either feel bad about themselves for drinking yes. or feel as if I had changed and that they couldn't really trust my future behavior. Mm-hmm. You know, that was that was uh, maybe an, an it, a poor strategy to play. Whereas... If, if I had the ability to remain composed and continue to get still, that might not have even been a topic of conversation that we approached. I think you're on to something now because what you're projecting is insecurity about what you're doing and who you are. Now you're projecting absolute security, almost authority in, in who and what you are, and you're right. Odds are it's not even going to come up. That was my experience all through college. No one ever tried to force me to have a drink. Like, Jesus, what do you want this guy to just fall over? He's clearly drunk already. I mean, that, that, it never came up. And all I'm suggesting is you're hitting on this powerful thing that happens when we get still you will drop down deeper and deeper and deeper into who you really are, not the repeating narrative. I'm not saying it's always going to be pleasant. I am promising you that you will be glad you did. Because you say you value, and I believe you, personal growth. That's where personal growth comes from. There's not much of me left Hmm. There's a lot of profundity in the. <laughs> no, I'm statement. just saying I've been I've been this this I, this isn't a game I'm playing when I say it's not about me it's not about my story there, there's no more story there's a little left I still have a photo ID that I recognize but there's, there's not a lot left yeah. but who I authentically am. And I think that's such a key point is is getting back to who and what you authentically are. And it seems so trite. It seems so uh, cliche. Be yourself, sure. you know, but there's so much to that. Yeah. And I think that clarity comes from being able to quiet the stories that might be clouding who yeah. and what you really are underneath all of that. Yeah. To, to connect to that and to be true to that. Yes. Yeah. And that's, again, a... That's the journey of a lifetime. It is. And I'm a geezer. Understand that. When I was in my 20s, I didn't I didn't know that. I'm a geezer. I'm living proof that any idiot can do this if you'll just keep at it. That's all. Yeah, I think something that was really key for me too was in stillness, asking myself those questions where it's, okay, if I'm not being authentic, if I'm really relying on what other people think, yeah. Who are those other people that I really care that much? What are their thoughts about me? Yeah. And then how can I strategically change that so that I don't necessarily have to get to that conversation? The thing that I was most afraid of was somebody asking me and the whole table going quiet, why aren't you drinking? Like that's the thing that I was the most afraid of. So go why? Because I wasn't confident in my answer and it was the state of mind. I think as, as we were just talking about this, it was the insecure state of mind that I would have then been projecting yes. to that group. Sure. Uh, that's, that's something that I think I was trying to avoid. Um, <laughs> do, those, do those friends like you? Yeah, I think they do. If you can't be who you are, how do they even know who it is that they like? Yeah, I think that's a, a very, uh, that's a big point. And I think that the way that I was dealing with it was picking one-on-one situations or not going to situations where that could be a possibility. Yeah, I think that after a while in terms of breaking the habit, you can then go into the, the belly of the beast and be strong enough. But while you have to sort of stabilize this intermediary form mm-hmm. and, and really identify with it. You have to yeah. practice the the action patterns to let mm-hmm. that go down mm-hmm. into mm-hmm. automaticity. Yeah. And I feel as if um, 
I think now I would still be semi insecure having that conversation if if the dinner table went quiet and everyone turned. Really? Um, Are you sure? I don't. I'm not confident in the state that I'd be able to bring to it. I'm not because I. I mean, I was just back uh, in England where a lot of these habits were formed in the first place. How much alcohol did you consume on that trip? None. Well, None. I no. I I lie. I had. Uh, Half of it, I'd never had more than half of a drink an evening. Okay. But that was because I was trying to avoid the conversation of why you're not drinking. And if I could just have, you know, a really, really watery Negroni by the end of the night, then that stopped people talking about it. Okay. So that's why I wasn't, this is where this is coming from, where I'm not, I'm not entirely certain that I could maintain that state of absolute stability with okay. it yet. Good. I still think that there's, there's Can work I suggest, to be done. I, I don't want to cut you off, but that's important. Can I suggest that that dependence on a fictitious projection of what other people might think is what's weakening you? It's what's creating more insecurity. Hmm. If these are your friends, they're your friends. They like Henry, not Henry 2.3, who's constantly drinking. Henry is growing. He's changing. If Henry becomes a stick in the mud because he's not drinking, that's a different issue. I'm suggesting you're anything but. I'm suggesting you may even be more of what they like. And if you can fake them out by putting half a Negroni in your hand and keeping it all night, who's fooling whom? What is that? What does that even mean? Because if by the end of that night they were all saying, Henry, what's wrong with you? Okay, we'd have a different discussion, but they didn't. Yeah, I think what I'm trying to get to and I, I love how I pick a topic and then turn this into therapy for Henry <laughs> <laughs> talk about living the dream eh? Um, but I think about if, if I were to do it again in the future what I would ask for is the strength and the resolve to be able to firstly not have that drink be able to maintain a much better state of mind yes. when answering the question as to why aren't you drinking sure. and just to Throw energy back. Yeah. Because if you have the right state of mind, you can answer any question. Well, may I suggest that if you just said Mercury is in retrograde and went right on eating, I think you'd probably sufficiently be Henry because that's what that's that like a great non sequitur, hilarious response. And then like what? What? But that's the kind of a response that would come from somebody who's had a couple of shots and is clowning around with his mates. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that's what I'm talking about, state. So what we're after is volitional state control, which is, that's one of the many portals that stillness will get us to. The ability to shift your state. So I just wanted to jump in here really quickly because I don't think the majority of you know this about me, but I was really, really good at drinking. Like it was my job and I could do it very well. So much so that people would never really know if I was drunk, rarely get hung over, so I could do it all the time and really enjoyed myself while drinking, right? You could say I derived a lot of meaning from this and I built a lot of really wonderful relationships that had rituals of drinking at the core of it. But ultimately, when looking at my life very rationally, I realized that it was holding me back. It was to a degree in terms of the person that I could become. And it has been a work in progress to help decouple the love for the people and the relationships I've established from the actual habit of drinking. Now, some of these tactics are helpful. There are two that I mentioned in particular. One of them was avoiding group situations, you know, just isolating and seeing people one-on-one -on -one so you can maintain that connection and like nurture the relationship. And the other one I was talking about was just removing myself from situations that drinking was encouraged. And so 
I think that they're both tactics, but not necessarily sustainable. For example, the second one, the latter, just removing the environmental cues, there's still this opportunity for spontaneous recovery. If I find myself in one of those environments again, I'm very prone to wanting a drink. And so I don't necessarily have independence. Now, what Jim's really helping me to do here is just question a lot of these unconscious conclusions that I've created, right? People only like me when I'm drunk. I'm not as fun when I'm sober. My friends won't like me if I'm not drinking with them. These are a bunch of if-then statements that I haven't validated whatsoever. However, if I actually go out and see whether there's truth to this, I might be pleasantly surprised. Huh, turns out people like me for me. Well, that's easy, right? And so he's really helped me to clarify this and to also clarify this end state that I truly desire. And again, this is a work in progress because I am not there yet. But the end state that I'm after is true independence, no tactics. I wanna be able to walk into any situation and maintain my state of mind, maintain my composure, and to connect and really just be there with people without having to think about whether I am or I'm not drinking. I want that to be completely out of the question, out of gamut. Anyway, that's what I'm after and I can't thank Jim enough for helping me get there because I know what it feels like to be insecure. I know what it feels like to be excluded. I know what it feels like to not feel like myself. But this practice has just helped me so much to chip away at all of those feelings and hopefully it can do the same for you. That's something that I'll strive for and I think that ultimately through stillness and through this conversation, this discourse, yeah. uh, this, this dialectic, yeah. this has really helped to uncover some of the subconscious processes that were trying to emerge. Sure. That uh, I was blocking because it, I thought that it might hurt my the story that I was telling myself. Mm -hmm. It and, will. <laughs> yeah, and maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Maybe that's but, a good thing. See, this is where I, I just so love and admire you because you're living your values. I don't expect... 0.01% of the people I encounter, let alone the whole population, to take it to this level and say, my internal freedom is more important than anything else. I'm tired of being a slave to my patterns, my habits, my fears, my worries. My blah, blah, blah. I'm just tired of that. So I want to get rid of all the things that are binding who I am, enslaving it. I want to be free. And then living it. Because that means you have to let go of everything past who and what you truly are. That means you have to go discover what that really is. We're in a culture that says, who are you? What do you do? That's you. I'm a, you know, vice president in charge of sitting by the door. That's who I have to be. <laughs> I am that. So if I'm in a, an aloha shirt and khaki shorts, there's something wrong. I have to be in a Brooks Brothers suit because I'm an executive VP guy. Okay. Or then when we go party hardy, I have to just live the debauched life because that's what the vice president in charge of sitting by the door has to do. That may not be authentic. But this culture isn't about engendering that kind of deep internal work. It's more about what's out here, which makes it even more important to explore what's going on inside. That's all. Because that's where the freedom is. And I think that that exploration, it's done pretty well through asking the right questions. It is. It's done pretty well through whether it be therapy or, or whatever that is. And there's a lot of overlap with those sure. two. Sure. Uh, but for me, it's, it's really been stillness. It yeah. has really been this act. And this is where I think it's, it's actually really frustrating for me. I was about to use the F word, but I didn't. It's actually really because we're going on the Disney Channel, aren't we? Mm -hmm. It's actually really frustrating for me because 
I had this completely wrong conception of what meditation is. Mm -hmm. And in order to communicate what stillness is, we have to sort of talk about things that it's parallel to so that people can get that first, like, got it, okay? Mm -hmm. And saying, oh, yeah, it's, it's meditation, you know? It, but the, the, the problem is with the conception of meditation is that that's, that's not in this associative bucket of, you know, self-growth and discovery. And even if it is, people get so turned off by those words because like self-growth yeah. and discovery, like what's that all about? Sure. And and because there's this, maybe there's this uh, unfamiliarity in our society with that type of endeavor. Mm -hmm. But if you tell somebody like, oh yeah, you know, Tai Chi or something like that, they're like, oh, you're physically strong and all of this stuff. Right. And Muay Thai and like all of these, all of these, uh, Which is actually a side benefit to yeah. it. It's like yoga. Yeah, The absolutely. side benefit is you, you get healthy, your body gets healthy. The it, side benefit. Exactly. And it's yeah. like that, that's accepted when having the conversations because it's like, oh, yeah, you, you know, you're shredding, you can kill me if you wanted to. That, right. that means that I now give you status for it. Yes. And it's frustrating because it's like instead of, what the what those actual practices are after when people go into them they go into learn self defense but they get in the back door oh i've got this complete introspective tool to now understand me better that i don't even want to get into the fight in the first place yeah. because wanting to get into the fight in the first place is saying more about something that's wrong in here rather than something that i need to display they learn that there's no self left to defend Yes, exactly. If they take it to the end. If they take it to the end. Yeah. And I guess what I'm trying to say is it's so frustrating because stillness, just this aspect of mental quiet and allowing all of these different, your hearts to emerge, that's literally how we started this conversation. Quiet the noise, listen to this huge emotive pump that is giving you information, that is communicating with you, but you're just blurring it out because mm -hmm. you'd much rather listen to the chatter mm -hmm. that's going on upstairs. Mm -hmm. You know, having the ability to quiet that chatter has meant that I've, I've been able to look at all of this stuff within myself. It is one of the coolest things around. It is, I feel like a 14 year old kid again, where I just want to run up to my bedroom and practice. Sure, you know? <laughs> sure. And that to me is like, it's so frustrating because you, you can't just, you can't put that on a bumper sticker. May I suggest something, though? Your enthusiasm, your authentic enthusiasm, not a carefully studied cool, but your unbridled authentic enthusiasm is going to be crucial to breaking that wall with a lot of people. Try to understand how perfect this all is. The, the reason more people aren't interested in trigonometry or U.S. history is that the people teaching it aren't that turned on by it. I know people who became math majors in college because they had a teacher who was so lit up by the fact that mathematics, and hear me, is an incredibly precise way to know God. <laughs> One of my best friends in college was a math major because he knew that and was in the process of doing just that. Because he wasn't happy with, eh, God is good, God is... No, he wanted to know more precisely. But he still wanted to know. I think you're going to open up as many doors to people to what stillness is by just being as enthusiastic as I am about it. But but being in in this particular group of of people that I'm way past, I'm I'm a geezer. And and that's the key. Why should I care about meditation? Well, you talk to somebody who's a master meditator and they, they would never do this, but, well, just light your lighter and put it under here. It's like it's starting to cook. 
That's why you want to be interested in meditation. Because if I can do that, there's very little in life going to get me. But that's one of those movie moments. These, these guys would never dream of doing that, though they could. What we're suggesting is that would be using parlor tricks. We don't want to do that. What we want is for people to find a place in themselves that says, wow, I get it. The reason I'm suffering is between my ears. It's not what's happening out there. The problem isn't the problem. The problem is my response to the problem because I don't know my mind. That's why stillness is not in competition with meditation. Meditation is a tool to help you learn to know your mind. That's all. And there's a thousand different versions of this. I love them all. There's not a single one I don't, I don't admire. They're just different ways. Some of them more directly, some of them indirectly, some of them are physical, some of them are very intellectual, some straight from the heart. Depends on who you are. But ultimately, it's very quiet in there. <laughs> And when the noise stops, who you really are is there. Here's a promise. It's perfectly content. It's happy. Well, Jim, I can't thank you enough for who you are because having this, mm. you've been so sort of non-biased in looking at all of these techniques and discovering them and and trying them out for yourself to then refine them, to then communicate this to other people so that you can share this state rather than telling somebody all oh, the benefits of meditation or cooking your finger on a lighter. Yeah. Actually giving somebody that experience within themselves rather than some sort of, again, parlor trick. Uh, that is, it's a very, very difficult tightrope to walk. And I know that there have been many shortcuts that have been presented to you along your path yeah. that you've decided not to take to remain authentic to your values yeah. and authentic to whatever it is that's inside of you. I mean, you were mentioning all of the college parties that you went to and didn't drink. There were probably a lot of tempting offers along the way there too. And I just can't thank you enough for your strength because there have been battles that I know that nobody has seen, only yourself. And for you to get to this point in your life, being absolutely pure to who it is that you are on the inside is a, a real example that I'm, I'm, just, I'm just so happy to know that people like you exist oh. because that gives me faith that I can develop into the person that I want to develop into. You already are. That's the point. There's nothing special about me. I'm just older. <laughs> That's all. You're doing a beautiful job of that. Just try to remember who you are doesn't map onto who I am. We're, we're very different. You're, you're having the courage to be authentically more and more who you are. Even if that flies in the face of what I'm saying is important, I'm trying not to say anything's important. But there are people who know me who think that I believe certain things are off the table. You can't, can't do that. that. That means I've failed in communicating that each one of us is completely unique. Mm. Our path is totally different. And that just sounds like some back of the tea package rubbish. It just happens to be true. Yeah, I mean, when we were talking about identity, uh, we brought up the example of Mozart and Beethoven. Yeah, and you know, there might have been an aspect where, of mimicry with Beethoven and Mozart. You know, let's play the piano like he does and see how it is. And I know that for myself that I had a, I I wanted to be like you at one point in my life mm. because of how much I respected what it is that you had done and who it is that you were. But I think the greatest liberation that I've gotten through stillness is knowing that my path is absolutely unique. Yeah. And to, to butcher a line that you used in the talk that we had about identity, it's like, 
I don't want to be a second rate gym. Yeah. Fuck that. Yeah. There's the F bomb. We got that, guys. Yeah, there you go. But I would much rather be a first rate version of myself. Exactly. And that pursuit, again, is freedom. That pursuit is everything that we've been talking about because yeah. that pursuit of being that first rate version of myself is mm -hmm. a constant checking in with what is that self. Yes. And what habits aren't necessarily yeah. conducive to that person. And how can I then adjust the circumstances and really adjust my state yeah. so that I can be that person in real time more of the time over and over. And if people don't like that, you know, right back to the identity piece, it's like, great, I should be absolutely content. They're doing you a favor. Yes, yes. Now, what, how can you possibly lose in the pursuit of that goal? How can you lose? You can't. I mean, someone going to tell you you're not doing it right? How, how would they know? It's the most exciting thing there is. It's the, it's the only frontier there is. That exploration right there. And wherever it leads, follow it. And then try, if you can, to build a community, because we need community, we need connection, of people who are at least enough of a like mind to respect the fact that this is where Henry's going, and ultimately we're all going a little bit different, a little bit different path. But we're in this together. And we're not expecting other people to robotically reinforce our insecurities by behaving the same way habitually, not to bring it back to our topic, again and again and again so we can predict what they're doing. Because frankly, that's a pretty boring person. I think your authentic self, the more it comes out, is going to eclipse this this bobo thing you were doing. It already has. You're you're not even remotely the same person I first met. Not even remotely. Well, it's because you taught me to th fish. So, thank you again, Jim. Um, I actually I can't thank you enough for all that I've learned about myself through this practice, through your example and through the work that we've done together. Oh, bless your heart. Well, you've done that work. That's the part I can't help anybody with. They've either got the willingness, the ability to do the work, or they don't. Now, that doesn't mean there's some prescribed way you have to do it, but if you, if you just don't care enough to do the work, because it is work, I'm not going to lie, and it isn't always a a trip through rose petals either. <laughs> I mean, it, it will burn. Yes. Just like a good workout burns. But the benefits, woof, way outlast that cherry chocolate cheesecake and the, and the habit of missing a workout. Well, on that note, let's tie a bow in this because um, we got our soppy moments in towards the end, which is... <laughs> starting to become a habit that I'm very fond of. Um, but I love you, Jim, and thank you again for chatting with me. And really, thank you for the therapy because I oh. came to a lot of understanding about myself in this one. <laughs> well, I love you right back. And I want to thank you for demonstrating your values by even doing this. This is not always easy. And I want to thank all of you for being interested enough to be here with us. Because if you're not, well, this is what's known as solipsism. <laughs> Henry and I are just talking to ourselves in a closet someplace. So thank you as well. All right. Well, Jim, on that note, let's go get a beer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm buying. So as always, thank you so much for tuning into this week's episode. Now, if you're looking to build a stillness practice yourself, we have a lot of free resources, audios that Jim's recorded, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see those in our show notes below. Along with that, 
There are also online courses that you can roll in if you want to learn more from Jim. We also have uh, Obsidian mind maps. You can see a couple of them popping up here on the screen. Now, these are really cool ways to look at the podcast information and really just get an overview of all of the podcast topics and deepen the information within yourself. And within them, there are more of Jim's recordings. There's also a lot of Jim's artwork. So if you're interested in any more still life stuff, you can find a bunch of links in the description below. Finally, I really hope that you're getting as much out of this as I have. This is why we started this whole thing in the first place, because the combination of Jim and the practice of stillness have really helped to transform our lives here at Still Life. We just wanted to make as much of that available to you. So hopefully you're getting a lot out of it. And please let us know if there's anything that you want to see more of in the future or less of. Anyway, hope you have a lovely day. Bye-bye.